Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to Carrie. Thank you to John for, uh, for great talks. So my name is Semyon. I'll be talking to you about aspects of the element technology today. Um, and and so, so let me start by describing that technology. So element sequencing at, at, the, at the heart of this technology is a construct that we call the avidite. And the avidite consists of this dye-labeled core. And then you see these linker arms with nucleotides on the end. And this has a uh, multivalent binding property, which has some really nice characteristics that I will go into. And briefly, if we just want to talk about a single um, sequencing cycle and how that avidite is used, that's in the top display. So if we want to identify a base, we bind these avidites and they come in four flavors, one for each nucleotide with a different dye label. We do the imaging to resolve which base uh, is, is being sequenced. And then we take a step along the template using an unlabeled nucleotide. Then we can later remove the block and then go again. So that's a sequencing cycle. So uh, a huge difference from sequencing by synthesis is now we have separated the process of identifying a base from the process of stepping along the template. With that, we can individually optimize those steps for quality, reagent consumption, et cetera. And I'll go into some of the benefits that that enables. The Avidite also has a very modular design. So if you want to switch out linkers, if you want to switch out the core, you can do that. And the, the polymerase sort of stays happy. So you can do really rapid development cycles with a structure. We have multiple versions of the Avidite in-house that we continue to, to work on and improve. So we've started to... Um, uh, put out preprints uh, on, on this on this technology. One is just a technology preprint, and I'll talk about a couple of the results that haven't previously been presented. We have, uh, with a really nice collaboration from GenCove, that one is focused on the low duplicate rate and the higher effective coverage that results. And then we had a rare disease study that that I presented last time, but but if you want to hear more details, it's up on MedArchive right now. So. Uh, what uh, we have done recently is, is, is quality training for a new chemistry called CloudBreak. You'll hear lots and lots of details from uh, Matt Kellinger in, in, in his talk on the CloudBreak chemistry. I'll just show you the, the end result, which are these quality scores. And here we have read one on the left panel and read two on the right. Um, this QQ plot shows predicted Q scores versus recalibrated Q scores. It's right on the diagonal, so you see that the quality scores are accurate. And then the histogram shows you where all of the data lives. So you see that the highest bin by far is this Q44. That's where the majority of the data you can see is Q40 and above for both of the reads. And again, you see where maybe slightly under predicting quality through the lower range, and then at the at the very high end, it's it, it, it's right on. So it gives you a sense of of the data qualities here. Um, and if you want to see it by cycle, here is a two by one fifty. This is aggregated across like twenty sequencing runs, and you can see that most cycles stay above Q forty on average, with a little bit of tailing off at the at the very end of read two. Of course, please ask me questions if you, if, you, if, if you have them. So this is one of the results of this, this Avidite and the individual optimization of each step are these very, very high Q scores. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can look at some difficult contexts. And the context that I will focus on are long homopolymers. And here, what we see uh, uh, is the long homopolymer, a homopolymer of length 12 or more, is actually at the zero. We're not actually showing the homopolymer itself. We're showing what happens before and after the homopolymer. So you see that before the homopolymer, the VT accuracy in blue, it, it, it's, it's, it's nice and low. Uh, the SBS is also low. But then what happens after the homopolymer? So the uh, a, a VT error rate stays roughly flat. And then you see that in SBS, there's a very, very large increase post homopolymer. So um, we wanted to study this a little bit more and understand like what, what exactly is going on. So we broke it down by length of homopolymer. So now what you see here are homopolymers of length four all the way through 29. And the, the AVT is, is, is the blue. And you can see that 
as the length of the homopolymer increases, the difference between the technologies increases as well. And the VT error rate is fairly flat all the way out to this um, length 29, which is, um, which is the pretty long homopolymer. Just to give you a sense, I, I didn't mention on the previous slide, but, but on this um, uh, 12 or more, there are over, there are in the order of 700,000 of these in the genome wide. So it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a very, it, it's not like just a couple of sites. So um, let's look at the whole distribution of error rate differences next. So here, what we do is we take a VT minus NovaSeq. We could also do this with, with NextSeq. Those uh, platforms are very comparable in this, uh, for, the, for, for, the, for this metric. And so when you take a VT mismatch percent minus NovaSeq mismatch percent, negative numbers is where SBS has higher error. Positive numbers is where um, a VT has higher error. And you can see it's, it turns out to be 97% of the loci where the VT has the lower mismatch rate following this homopolymers. Um, and I have the fifth, the 50th, and the 95th percentiles of the distribution here marked. So if we just take what happens to be the 50th percentile locus and pop it up in IGV, then you get this picture. And uh, you can see uh, the homopolymer is the blue bar over here. And then you can see the read stack for Aviti and the read stack for, for SBS, in, in, in this case, NovaSeq, and the various mismatches that enter the picture that are, that are likely the result of that uh, homopolymer. Questions? Oh, okay. All right. So let me go now from technology to applications. And the first application that I'd like to highlight is exome sequencing with our partners at Twist. So Twist kindly provided this slide. Um, there, they have this excellent exome product. It, it is about uh, 40 megabases in size. It cover it covers all the important regions. And importantly, it was optimized for, for the NovaSeq instrument, but we wanted to see how would it perform on, on, on a VT. We want to pay special attention to some of these advertised metrics, such as the fold 80 penalty, the on target rate, and the duplicate rate. So I'll get back to those in, 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 a, in a second. The first thing, and, and the way that we do exome is using our 150 cycle kit. So that's two by 75 exome. The coverage I'll, I'll show it's between 70 and 100, but of course that's, that's flexible and depends on your multiplex levels. And so you can see here with these relatively short reads, the Q, it's, it's Q40 all the way along, Q40 and above. And when we start to look at those metrics, you can see that the fold 80 is right uh, below that 1.35 value for, for, for all of the samples that we looked at. The uh, duplicate rate is very, very low. Part of that is the property of the, uh, of the twist panel itself. And part of that is because the element doesn't really add any optical duplicates at all. And then the last panel is on target rate. And you can see that all samples, again, are above the 90% target. When we then take this all the way through variant calling, uh, and we, here we use standard open source methods. This is BWA MEM. This is deep variant. It is the 4.2.1 genome in a bottle truth set. And you can see the, the recall precision and F1 score for SNPs is, is, is nearly one. Uh, for indels, this is kind of a, a, the, the typical thing that you see for, for exome sequencing. And again, this was all optimized for, for, for Nova. And this is, of course, uh, a VT out of the box. We think that we can do further optimization for in a, in a, in a platform-specific manner, but, but it's working really well out of the box. So the next application that, that I'd like to talk about is whole genome sequencing with long inserts. So one aspect of our technology that I didn't talk about is the upfront amplification. So when we start with a DNA fragment on the flow cell, it's actually a circular library fragment, and it's amplified via rolling circle amplification. And one thing that we wanted to understand is what are some of the properties of rolling circle amplification? And an area of particular, insert, of, um, particular interest was long inserts. And so why might you want to make your inserts longer? Well, intuitively, it's actually a lot like making your reads longer, but in many ways easier. So the study was motivated by a simulation. 
we have a simulation framework, open source. It's called Meet. And you can do perfect reads, and they are uniformly distributed, uh, just Poisson random sampled across the genome. And then you can say, well, what's the performance of those reads as a function of insert size? So we started with a simulation study, and we went from 300 all the way out to 1,500. And we see a, a significant drop in the total errors. This is the false positives, which stay fairly uniform. But you see what happens to the false negatives. The, that's the SNPs and the indels. The false negative rate goes down significantly. And the intuition is with longer inserts, you can reach into some of the more difficult regions of the genome for alignment. So you can imagine a certain repeat that isn't handled by short inserts, but it's spanned by long inserts. And since you're sequencing the ends, you get coverage where you didn't previously have coverage. So based on the simulation, we thought, can we make this a reality? And we were able to actually generate uh, these, these libraries, and these are now aligned insert lengths. And you can see that we uh, um, easily hit the 300, but then you can see that we were able to generate this, this last distribution over here, which has an average of over 1,000, and some inserts actually go beyond 2,000 aligned. So this is not like Biotrace. This is actually from alignment. So these are some of the longest inserts that I, had, that I really had ever seen. And I wanted to understand what would be their performance in variant calling. Um, and, and, and this was their performance. And it was actually uh, really interesting to see the simulation play out. So you can see on the far right, that's a publicly available run that, that we released uh, back, back, back in June. It already benchmarks extremely well. So you can see in the order of 30,000 total errors, you can see the SNP F1.9955, the Indel F1.9961. It, 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 it's, it's great benchmarking. And again, here it's standard methods, BWA MEM alignment to a linear reference. So nothing fancy going on with, with, with the alignment. Deep variant, they did train a model for us on, 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 on limited data. Genome in a bottle, 4.2.1, and this is 35x. And what you see with the, with the long insert runs, I, I won't show you some of the intermediary runs. I'll just focus on two that we did at the, at the longest insert. And you can see that uh, strong drop in the false negatives. And uh, our, our intuition, again, was that we're reaching into some of the difficult to align regions, and now we're able to get those. Um, I'll, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show how that intuition actually plays out. But first, we also wanted to see how this behaves across the, all of the GC content bins. So most human data is like in the middle over here, but you do have some of the AT and GC extremes. And you can see all of them are uh, fa fa fairly flat, but long insert does even better than the standard insert lengths. So going back to the false negatives, here's just a sampling of um, SNPs that were false negatives in the 300 to 350 base pair insert run and how they are picked up via one of these new long insert runs. So you can see in the top display, you just don't have, in some case, any coverage or in some case, not enough coverage or a lot of MAPQ0 stuff, and you're not able to make the call. And across the board, and this is, this is very typical, now you see that the long inserts reach in, and now you're able to get the coverage where you previously didn't have it, and now you're able to make those SNP calls that match the truth set. Okay, so so the, the intuition was very much uh, um, in agreement with, with, with the empirical study. So um, that's, that's, uh, those are the results that I really wanted to show you. So in conclusion, we have um, uh, 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 this new sequencing technology, and uh, the advantages include the high Q scores and the sequencing of the difficult regions. We can do many, many applications. Two of the latest ones are exome sequencing with twist and the whole genome sequencing with long inserts. And at this point, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks. Yes, please. Uh, uh, yes, in the result, if I introduce so for the non insert WJS, so you mean that uh, for the element sequencer, it supports more long reads, uh, these are the sequences, but for Illumina sequencer, it is much uh, shorter. 
So I, I yes, and and of course you'd have to check out the the latest Illumina capabilities. We we haven't seen this at least in the publicly available Illumina data. Uh, so the way we do amplification and the way SBS technology does amplification is completely different. Uh, so tip the, 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 we, we we haven't seen th these lengths of insert in the SBS data. Yes, please. So what was the sequencer handle um, in a library of uh, a lot of different sizes, right? So if I put on something I've got as much as 300 as I have 1,500, yeah. Uh, yeah. am I going to get... Um, Am I going to get an effect of that? If I love more 1,500, is it going to be preferentially looked at? And I guess my question is, how are you going to do your quality filtering? Is it by individual sample, or is it by the uh, application of the whole panel? Um, so the, the question I have for you is, you seem a really broad curve. Yeah. Yeah, so so we were actually really pleased to see that, th that the aligned data actually showed uh, this, whole, the, 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 this whole breadth of peak. When we mix libraries, we do see a left shift. So there, there is a preference for those smaller, and we don't know whether that's in the initial hybridization, whether that's in the amplification. Uh, we see that bias in SPS as well. Uh, but here, we were actually, we actually did see based on alignment fragments up at 2,000, which was, which was really cool to see. Um, consider uh, maybe putting this onto some kind of device to select away your small material and just mm -hmm. want something very tight to be done that. Yes, that works really well, but like thin slicing a gel is a pain and it's already PCR free and you don't get a ton of material. So yeah, you can do it, but you have to work for it. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> just add one comment that I mean, this may be data that even hasn't seen. If we pool samples post circularization, you don't see that left shift. Hmm. So you can, you can, it can be avoided. Interesting. Awesome. Very interesting. Yes, please. And I never understood why yeah. with Illumina, if you go longer, you lose the quality of the secondary. So that's why when there was the, the old uh, resamplification, it was not possible to go over 500. Now with the X, I think it's possible. But you, you have a drop in the quality of the secondary if you go very long. And uh, the number of uh, copies that you have of the same original fragment decrease when you go longer compared to each other. So it's a it's a it's a concatomer. So we don't really expect to be losing copies per se, but everybody decreases in quality as you go longer and longer because you have the accumulation of phasing and prephasing. Now you can control your phasing and prephasing rates and you can do really, really well. But regardless of SBS versus avidity, eventually the accumulation of phasing and prephasing, as well as things like laser damage, will catch up to you. It was just the fragment with the Lumina. That ah. If you go longer, that you have a fragment. Oh, the fragment longer, not the read length longer. I'm sorry, I, I, I misunderstood. Oh, interesting. So, so we haven't looked into that closely. What, what we. Um, what we do know again is that the amplification methods are completely different. So whether you're talking about bridge, X amp, rolling circle, they'll all have their their different properties, and yeah, you'll you'll see differences for sure. I have another question for you. Yes, please. How dialable is the sequencer? If I want to do two fifty by fifty, or I want to do one hundred by two hundred, right? It's yeah. something I can do on the Illumina sequencers. Can I do this on the? Uh... Sure. Sure. Um, so we sell like a, a 150 kit or a 300 kit and then do what you want with those cycles, split them up any which way. And interesting, I didn't go into this, but on the twist exome data, we actually got slightly better results doing 100 plus 50 instead of two by 75. That's brand new. So we haven't dug in in a lot of detail, but I think there is uh, there are some cases where asymmetric read lengths can, can have benefit. Of course. Other uh, questions? Nope. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for, for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.